Welcome back to Phoenix Forge. Thanks for joining us again today for another Essential Skills lesson. Now in today's lesson, I'm going to be covering Smith and Striker work. So, Smith and Striker work. What do you need to know? What are the basics? That's what we need to cover today. Now, you're obviously going to need yourself a sledgehammer. And when you're starting out in blacksmithing, you know, you're unlikely to be able to rush out there and buy yourself a power hammer. You might like to, and some of you probably can afford to, but not everyone can. And certainly a sledgehammer is a bit more versatile and you can do an awful lot more with it, certainly on a small scale, than you can with power hammers. So, what can we do? Well, you can punch holes with punches, you can fuller, you can flatter, you can swage, um, you can also, of course, forge, you can do set downs, you can chop off your steel using hot cuts um, and millions of other operations. The great thing about a sledgehammer is just how versatile it is. You know, if you want to forge a taper, or well, you don't need to go making tapered blocks for power hammers, you can simply use one of these and bring it down at an angle. It's great. Brilliant bit of kit. Get yourself one of these. Okay, so Smith and Striker, what is it? Well, the Smith is the one on this side who's controlling the forge and in charge of the fire and the hot metal and what tools we're going to use. Your Striker, in my case, is Kristen today. Um, and they're in charge of giving us some power with the aid of the sledgehammer. So, um, if we just go for this quickly, quick minor demonstration. Ready? Up. Good. Smith and Striker. So with Smith and Striker, as you just saw, there's two roles. The Smith and the Striker. And both of their roles are different and they're both very, very important. The smith's job is obviously to control the forge, control where the heat is going to be on the bar and what's happening in there. Um, and of course your striker is delivering their power. Now it's up to the smith to get the steel hot in the right places, bring it out and most importantly keep it in the same place on the anvil. So that the striker isn't having to adjust their body, isn't having to adjust where they're bringing the hammer down every single time. The smith is also in charge of the verbal and non-verbal commands. Uh, we don't typically use a lot of verbal um, commands during Smith and Striker. Typically, I only use um, up, which is deliver one more blow. It's not stop. Stop in the forge is a safety issue. Someone's doing something dangerous, um, then we'll say stop and everybody stops what they're doing. Um, when we say up, that means you continue your last blow, you strike, and then you bring your hammer to rest. Up in the air, ready to deliver that next blow. But it's up to the uh, Smith to work out what tools and equipment they're going to be using next. And so if I grab something like a fuller, it's up to me to make sure that tool is in the correct position, that I'm then moving the material where I want it to move. As I say, the striker is just following my commands. Now, swinging a sledgehammer. Now, most of you have probably swung one of these in anger before, smashing up concrete and breaking down walls. They were invented by blacksmiths for blacksmiths for doing this. Um, and all you guys using them at home as builders are using them wrong, sorry to say. So, using your sledgehammer. Now, you want to pick a sledgehammer that you're comfortable using. There's no point rushing out and getting yourself a 20 pound beast and then being able to swing it for all the five minutes before you collapse on the floor of exhaustion. Typically in the forge, we normally use something about eight to 10 pounds, um, unless you're going for a double-handed sledge and that's a different game altogether, but a fun one. Um, so this is my favorite sledge I've got in the workshop. This is actually an antique railway sledge um, that I bought locally at a car boot sale many years ago. Um, and it's an absolute beauty. Used to build the railways in the 1800s around here and uh, still going strong today. Now there's more to swinging a sledgehammer than first meets the eye and getting the correct technique is really important. It's not all about power, it's about accuracy. Um, you know, if you get this, this wrong and you bring it down, you miss the top tool and hit the handle, you run the risk of breaking your Smith's uh, wrist or certainly doing damage to their elbow, if not breaking the tool as well. So it's uh, really important that you use the correct technique with doing this. Um, I'm right-handed, so I use right-handed forging technique. The left hand, everything's in reverse. Um, I'll let you guys figure that out, you weirdo lefties. Now, right hand at the top of the hammer, left hand at the bottom. Nice and easy so far. So if we look at my feet, I typically work with my left foot forwards. My right foot is uh, shoulders width apart and it's at 90 degrees to my left foot. Now for those of you who haven't swung one of these before and done Smith and Striker, what you want to do is put a mark on the anvil where the Smith is going to take the work out and place it each time. You're then going to take your hammer 
place it on that mark, and then adjust your stance, adjust your grip, until you're happy and confident that you can bring that sledgehammer down in exactly the same place every time. When I'm running forging classes on the weekends, and we do axe making and knife making classes, as well as all the others, um, I go through this with all of the new uh, beginners. So Kristen, if you can find a bit of wood for me, and jump in here. Now when I get my beginner smiths to uh, swing a sledgehammer for the first time, we always do it with a nice wide board. Um, so if Kristen, you can lay that down on the anvil. Make sure it's nice and flat. If you've got a slight gap under here, as you strike it, it's gonna snatch in your hands and pull it down flat. Now my hammer's at rest in the center of my anvil, in the center of that piece of timber. I can adjust my feet so I get a nice comfortable stance and I can make sure I'm the correct distance from the anvil. So it's a double motion, left arm comes out, right arm comes up to the shoulder and you wanna use that bounce from the anvil to bring the hammer back up. Nice and comfortable. Now that's forging flat on the anvil. Um, the advantage of using this technique over the concrete breaking uh, stance is that we can introduce things like top tools which change the height of the strike. So I'm now four inches higher than I was before and all I need to do is adjust the height of my elbows slightly so that I adjust my pivot point and my hammer comes down square on that top tool no matter what it is. Now all the top tools have different sizes, uh, yeah, it's a flatter. Um, the flatter's different again. But again, it's quite easy for me to adjust my stance very easily um, and ensure that my hammer is coming down square with the tool. Uh, because if you strike at a squiff angle, what you're gonna end up doing is firing the tool off the side, uh, which makes the job harder for the smith. It will take a little bit of practice. It's not something you can get straight away. Uh, it, I'd expect it to take a, a beginner smith a couple of hours to really get a good feel for the process. And, um, but it's nice and easy. You know, you can get your mate from down the pub to come and swing a sledgehammer for you. They're normally happy to come and volunteer. Uh, it's not usually too difficult to uh, encourage people to swing a sledge. Now that stance is all important. And if you're doing it wrong, you're going to end up hurting yourself. So, right hand at the top of the hammer, left hammer at the bottom. Now when you're smashing concrete, your left arm comes down on the left hand side of your body or you're absolutely going for it. When you're smi striking on the anvil, you want to make sure that your left hand comes across your body. It will feel weird. It does feel strange when you're first doing it. But after a while, you'll get the technique. And it is that rocking motion and using obviously the recoil from the uh, strike to bring the hammer back up uh, will give you a lot less fatigue. Um, but yeah, as I say, there's some good videos on YouTube of people doing this wrong and getting a nasty surprise when they bring the hammer handle in the wrong place. Now in the next few weeks, we're gonna be demonstrating how to forge some basic tongs. Um, I hope to do some wolf jaw tongs next week. Uh, and for those of you at home who haven't got power hammers and, all, and hydraulic presses, picking, getting your mate to pick up a sledge and, and swing it for you is definitely the way forward. Now when we're playing Smith and Striker with this, the Smith always goes first or they issue the commands. So the striker is uh, usually poised and ready. They usually get shouted from across the workshop. If it's a bit noisy, what the smith will do is give, that, uh, give the anvil a bit of a ring. And that lets the striker know that they're up to come and swing a hammer. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Up. There we are. So the smith is bringing the piece of work out of the fire, putting it in exactly the same place. My job as a striker is just to bring the, my hammer down uh, in the same place every time. And that's as simple as that. Nice and easy for technique number one. So in just a couple of heats, we've managed to take our bit of 16 square and forge it out to 25 by five, um, nice and easily. No bother at all. I haven't even broken a sweat. So when it comes to forging things like tong reins, it's certainly an awful lot easier to do it with a Smith & Striker than it is to try and struggle on your own uh, and try and forge it out. Now, if we want to do Smith & Striker, we're not just limited to working on the center of the anvil. The nice thing about being a striker is that you've got that versatility. We can move all over the anvil to any location. So for instance, if I want to use a hot cut hardy, I can simply come over here. Oh, good. And we can cut our bar up um, and do all sorts of other things. So if we're doing some drawing out, for instance, we can come over to the BIC. Up. 
Good. And we can draw out quicker using the Bic, using the Hardy, uh, punching over the Pritchell, anything. There's all sorts of different processes that we can do um, by using the striker. And the nice thing is, you know, if you've already got one set of tool in because you've been working on your own in the forge um, and you set up to work on an anvil, you know, your striker has got the versatility to be able to use all of that kit again. Now, the second technique that I want to show you guys today is how to punch holes. And it's a technique that we use regularly, especially when we're running our axe making glasses. Um, we typically use a handled punch so that you don't run the risk of using a hand punch and the striker missing and breaking your arm, because that hurts. Um, so these are typically about half the length and that helps with deflection. So if your striker gets the angle slightly wrong, you've got less chance of bending or breaking the tool um, and it's much easier to control and manage. Okay, so I've got a nice piece of steel, nice and hot. Take my hammer out of the way, I don't need that anymore. Now I'm gonna use my punch. I wanna line it up in the center of my bar. Now as a smith, I can only typically see the back of the punch. So it's up to the striker to inform me if my punch is wonky. Okay, one. And when I'm marking up, typically I do one blow. We have a look at the mark to see how it's getting on. If it needs adjusting, you can adjust it at this stage. Okay, one. You can come in and put a second mark in there. Now on the first heat, all we typically do is mark up. And as you saw, Chris in there, swing a the sledge, and we've got an indent now in that piece of work that not only can I see visually, but I can also find out with my punch, and I know next time when it's nice and hot, I can find my mark and we can drive through. So on the second heat of my bar, I don't need to see where the mark is, I can find it with my punch, go. Now typically, I do six to eight hammer strikes before I need to call off the end of my punch. And it's important you do, otherwise it'll get stuck in the hole, okay? Up. Now, I can feel there that we're getting resistance off the hammer, which means my um, punch is nearly at the bottom of my hole. And I can come in from the other side, okay? Good, and again, cooling it down. Now, Kristen was feeling the resistance there. I could see it, I could hear it in the, the uh, ring of the anvil as well. And my slug from the, uh, the hole has now touched the anvil and it's got a flat surface. Now, my slug is ready to be knocked out. So what I need to do is go over to the edge of my hardy so the material is being supported. Um, and with each blow, what I'm gonna do is move my punch over to the far edge, which will help to support both sides. You can, of course, use a bolster plate, but I haven't got one the exact size, or you could use a swage block, also really great for doing this. So, Kristen, if you can give that a tap for me. Okay. Up. Now, not everything goes according to plan. Sometimes your slug just refuses to let go. When that does happen, you can give that to your striker. Grab yourself a handheld punch, come in on the edge at 45 degrees and shear it off nice and cleanly. Now this takes me over to one of our other tools that we can use, which is of course the flatter. It's got a great big wide face, uh, typically 50% larger than your standard hammer would do, and it's for flattening, hence the name. So I'm gonna bring my bar out of the fire when it's nice and hot. I'm gonna lay my flatter on top and we're gonna use a striker to sort of smooth it out and take some of those marks and indents out. Okay. Up. There we go, as easy as that. Now with each hammer blow, typically what I do is lift it up ever so slightly to see what's going on. Place it back down, make sure it's flat. What you do not want to do is use it and dig the corners in. Otherwise you'll leave some horrific marks. Go on, give it a blow there. Like that, which you definitely don't want to do. You're putting deep galls in your work like that, you're gonna to struggle to get them out later on even with the use of a flatter. Now there's lots of other top tools that you can use. This one's a top filler and we can use it for lots of different things. So if you want to go. Up. You can use it for forging down. And drawing out like we're doing. Up. You can use it for adding texture into the work or we can use it in combination with its partner, which is of course the bottom fuller. 
Now, working top and bottom tools, you need to make sure they're nice and aligned. They're as approximately the same size. Go on. And again. And again. And again. And again. One more. Up. Good. So as you can see, using the top and bottom fuller, you can do things like double setting. Um, I typically, when I'm working on my own, use a blacksmith's helper. But if I'm double fullering, it's quite handy to use a top and bottom fuller. Um, or you can use the power hammer, of course, or the fly press, or the hydraulic press. There's lots of different ways of doing this, but this is the oldest method. Um, and it still works, and it's a great thing to be able to do. Now, one of the other tools that you can, of course, use is the top and bottom swage. Now, these are really handy if you're doing journals on gates, um, if you're doing pins, you're setting down tenons, and all sorts of other things. I haven't got anything ready to go. Um, so I've just picked up a random bit of round bar, but you can see the radius matches top and bottom um, and it allows you to round up bar as well and get a really nice finish. The, the most important thing we probably use this for is of course forging tenons when you've done the double set down and you then want to round it up and get it to match the hole um, and it's really handy. You simply rotate that underneath the hammer while it's hot and keep striking and it will round it up beautifully. Um, as you can see, mine don't get a huge amount of use because I normally do this particular process under the power hammer, but they're incredibly handy things to have. Now, we're not limited to just top and bottom fullers, swages, um, what else do we use? Flatters, things like butchers, set downs, all sorts of other stuff. There are loads and loads of top and bottom tools and top and bottom combinations that you can use with, during your forging, working Smith and Stryker. Um, here's a small selection of some of the ones that I've got in the workshop. Now, as you can see from my tools on the rack, there's some of them that get used all the time, and there's some very rusty ones that hardly ever get used. Um, if you're starting out, don't think you need to rush out and buy yourself hundreds of these things. Lots of them have just been made by myself or my former employees um, as we've needed them. Or I've picked the old ones up at car boot sales or off places like eBay and Facebook Marketplace. Um, they're brilliant bits of kit to have, and the more of them you've got, the more opportunities you've got to do different processes and to work in different ways. Um, don't rush out and buy yourself a power hammer when you're starting out, but I would strongly advise you rush out and get yourself a couple of sledgehammers. Now, there's only one thing better than having one sledgehammer, and that's having lots of sledgehammers. So here's a bit of footage of some of the previous classes we've had in the workshop, and I've got a little one extra for you. Now, I hope you guys have found this week's uh, episode interesting. Um, let us know what you think in the comments. If there's any other tips and tricks that you want to see, let us know and we'll make a video about it. Uh, as always, guys, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram. You can help support the channel on Patreon, help me make more videos for you guys. Um, and as always, remember to click like and subscribe and we'll see you here next time in a workshop. Cheers, guys.